So we're into the study of ecology and we're going to look at ecology and basic ecological concepts and you should notice that this is one of the student learning objectives for this course so make sure you've got all those flashcards out you've got all these terms really really understood and memorized because you know these things are going to pop up on the tests and on the cumulative final so we're doing ecology uh, the study of in the way in organisms interact with other organisms and their non-living surroundings. So we have two things straight away here that you need to know about. Abiotic. Abiotic means non-living. So anything in the environment that's not living. So the temperature of the area, the amount of rainfall in the area, the pH, the acidity of the soil or the water. Um, how many snowy days there are, how much light is present at the ground level. They're all abiotic factors. And then we have biotic factors. Biotic, bio means life. So that's everything um, to do with the life interacting with an organism, so other life forms. So members of its own species that it interacts with, members of other species that it interacts with, uh, organisms that it eats, and organisms that cause it disease. They are all biotic factors. Now your textbook uses this diagram to explain the organizations and levels in ecology. Um, it's a fairly confusing diagram so what I've done is on the next page I've simplified it and uh, given you the key terms that you need to know about. On this diagram, what we can really see is on the left-hand side we have biotic interactions. On the right-hand side we have the abiotic interactions. Uh, but it's the key terms that you're really interested in, so switch to the next slide. And here was all the terms that you got to know. Uh, you need to know uh, what an organism is, what species are, all the way down through biosphere. So use your textbook and use Google or Bing, look them up. And as you're given the definitions, make sure that you state whether this is just biotic, abiotic, or both. For example, an organism is obviously a biotic factor. An organism is a living thing. So that's biotic, it's not abiotic. Um, whereas biosphere, bio meaning life, sphere meaning a ball-shaped object, the biosphere is the part of the planet that contains life. So it's everywhere on our planet that there is life. And obviously that's contained in the life and all the other parts of the planets, the rocks, the oceans, the atmosphere, the air. So that would be both biotic and abiotic in nature. So you've got to look all these up and make sure you know what they all are. One key term that's used as we study ecology is the term limiting factors. So when we're looking at the population of an organism, its population is limited by certain resources. Those limited resources are the limiting factors, the things that limit the size of a population, or the things that limit the extent of a habitat, limit where an organism can live. So if we look at our picture here, obviously there is nowhere near enough water in this area of Africa to support the cows, we'll see other pictures of this later on, to, see the, to support the cattle that are trying to live there. Um, the limiting factor here is availability of water. Plenty of temperature to keep the plants healthy, keep the animals healthy. Plenty of sunlight to keep plants and animals healthy, but not enough water for the plants to survive not enough water for the animals to survive. So here's our limiting factor being water. Now as we move around obviously in the ocean the limiting factor would not be water. Um, it may be the pH of the water limiting corals. It may be the temperature of the water that limits coral reefs. Or it may even be uh, the light availability. Even at the perfect latitude and longitude for coral growth, if the water is too deep, if the coral is trying to grow too deep, there will not be enough light available down there and the corals won't grow properly. So limiting factors, any factor that restricts the presence of an organism or restricts their population size. Now as we look at uh, the types of organisms around the world, 
we see that limiting factors influence the number of species found in different areas on the planet. So if we are um, in northern latitudes up near the North Pole, we do just find many, many fewer species than as you move down towards the equator. Um, so obviously there seems to be more limiting factors up in northern climates and fewer limiting factors found down in uh, more equatorial climates towards the equator. And there's a lot to do with day length. If you think about winter up in the North Pole, uh, you may get absolutely no days of sunlight. Photosynthesis is definitely restricted by sunlight. It's a limiting factor. Temperature is a limiting factor. Freezing temperatures prevents photosynthesis up in northern areas. Um, the growing season, the number of days where we get enough temperature and sunlight and enough water to grow is limited up in northern latitudes. So we see this ecological concept that northern latitudes have a harsher environment, more limiting factors than equatorial countries. And if we were on the south hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, we'd see exactly the same thing. At the South Pole, we have many limiting factors, and as you would then move towards the equator, the number of species would increase. So it's not just a northern hemisphere um, item, it's found in both hemispheres on the planet. So it's not just on the planet we see it, it's also within countries. So within uh, the United States, as you move north, you see a decrease in the number of species. And that's not because of human action, that's not because of pollution, that's not because of degradation of the environment, that's just because that's a normal ecological concept. So we know that um, different areas of the world can hold different numbers of species. The more northern you are in the northern hemisphere, the fewer species are held in a particular ecosystem. Each type of animal or plant within that ecosystem, each species within that ecosystem, is going to have a limited area where it can actually live. The area that will support a particular species is said to be that species habitat. It's the actual area that can survive and live. The niche of that organism is its actual functional role. Is it a producer to produce food? Is it a herbivore that eats those producers? Or is it a carnivore? And more than just how it feeds, it's how it interacts with all of the other organisms and its physical environment. So how does it change the environment that it's actually living in would be considered part of its niche. Now, I say niche. Um, that's an a English way of saying the term. You might hear it called niche. So niche and niche uh, are two ways of pronouncing this word. And it seems to be that some English people say niche, some say niche. And it seems to be that some Americans say niche and some say niche. How you pronounce it's up to you. Um, I don't care. You'll hear me say niche the whole time. Uh, but if you want to call it niche, then that works just fine. Now beavers are given as a nice example of habitat and niche. We know that beavers live in fairly cool environments. They live in an aquatic environment, so they live in water, in ponds and streams. We know that they eat wood, and when they eat wood, they will often fell small trees so they can get at the juicier bark and leaves towards the top of the tree because they can't climb the tree, so they bring the tree to them. And they also fell trees uh, to use wood to dam small creeks and small lakes to produce water deep enough uh, for their protection. They build their beaver lodge. They need underwater entrances to and from the lodge so they can enter it without predators being able to get in. And they're going to build a dam to generate water levels just right for their beaver lodge production. So obviously their niche would include the fact that they change the environment around where they live. They pull down trees, they remove trees from the habitat, they encourage the growth of grasses by removing those trees, they change grassland into a pond 
by building beaver ponds, and they provide habitats for other organisms, fish and ducks, by changing those uh, water environments where they live. So now you know um, what a habitat is, and you know what a niche is. And next two that we need to do a community. A community is a group of interacting species. Now remember that species are organisms that can reproduce together to produce viable offspring. So species can reproduce to produce viable offspring. Viable offspring being offspring that can reproduce to have children themselves. So to be viable you'd have to have children that have children that have children. So a group of interacting species, that is a community. Um, the community plus its abiotic environment, that's an ecosystem. So that's the living and the non-living portion of the environment combined makes up that ecosystem. Within each ecosystem, we really have a number of different types of organisms. And there's three broad categories, three major groups. The first group are the producers. So producers produce complex organic substances. Uh, complex organic substance is a nice scientific way of saying food. Okay? Producers produce food for themselves and all of the other organisms within the ecosystem. So producers are going to do photosynthesis or chemosynthesis to take carbon dioxide and join it together with water to make sugars. So they're going to do our photosynthesis, capturing energy into potential energy that is in food. They are producers. Consumers, as the name says, consume stuff. They eat organisms to get their matter. So you're a consumer because you eat plants and animals to get your energy. So anything that's a herbivore or a carnivore, they're all consumers. Consumers come in a couple of different types. Primary consumers uh, are our first consumers. Primary means first. And they're going to eat plants. So they're also called herbivores. So primary consumers and herbivores are interchangeable. They mean the same thing. Organisms that eat plants to get their energy. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. So secondary consumers eat a primary consumer, so they're going to eat an animal, and therefore can be called carnivores. And there's also tertiary consumers. Tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers, so they're also carnivores. And there are other levels. Each level eats the one beneath it. So tertiary consumers eat secondary, quinternary consumers eat tertiary consumers. So it just goes primary consumer, secondary consumer. And spelling those words, primary, secondary, tertiary, quinternary, is always problematic for students. And there's a nice shorthand way of doing it. What you do is you put down the number with what looks like a little degree symbol next to it. It's called the prime. So it would look like one with a little zero um, superfix above it. That would be primary consumer. A two with a little degree symbol, a two with a little zero superfix would be a secondary consumer. Tertiary would be three with that tiny little zero written above it. So that would be a tertiary consumer. And notice down there there's also omnivores. Omnivores are a mixture of both primary and secondary or tertiary consumers. And that's where humans fit. We eat salad, so we're acting as a primary consumer. But we also eat steak, where we're acting as a secondary consumer. And we also eat things like tuna, and tuna themselves are tertiary consumers, so we're being quinternary consumers when we're eating tuna. And our last group, there's our decomposers. Things that get their energy from dead organic matter, from non-living organisms. So once you die, it's decomposers that use you as an energy source. Now remember the first and second law of thermodynamics. First law of thermodynamics. You should be able to tell me what that is. It is energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but can 
change forms. And our second law would be every time you do energy change, useful energy is lost. So when we have an ecosystem, energy has to be continuously supplied to that ecosystem. Right? You can't just pop it into existence, you have to get it from somewhere. So for most ecosystems on the planet, the sun is the source of energy. So sunlight energy passes into the ecosystem. It's captured by producers doing photosynthesis and it's captured by being stored as potential energy in food, in sugars. So photosynthesis converts sunlight into high quality potential energy, stored energy within the food. Our consumers need to use energy to survive and they get their energy by eating that sugar. So you eat plants, take those chemicals, get your energy from those high quality energy chemicals, breaking it down, and utilize the energy. And as you do that, you're going to generate low quality heat. You change it from high quality energy into low quality energy. Now, energy flow is therefore coming into the ecosystem and passing through the ecosystem, coming in as sunlight, being converted into high quality energy, sugar, being passed from organism to organism and is eventually lost as low quality heat. So we go from sun through the organisms towards heat. Which means that energy passes through the ecosystem in just a one-way flow. It's one-way flow or sometimes called linear flow. From sunlight through the organisms and then is lost as heat. You don't get to recycle that energy. It may go from a producer to a consumer to a decomposer, but the energy is not recycled. The energy is lost as heat. The matter is different. Matter does cycle through the ecosystem. The matter cycles through. A great example would be CO2. Carbon dioxide is sucked in by plants and locked into sugar. So it's come from the air and is locked in the sugar. That sugar is eaten by the animal, and when the animal uses the sugar, it breathes out carbon dioxide. So we went from CO2 in the air into sugar in the plant, into sugar in the mouse, back into CO2 in the air. That is cyclic. So matter flow shows a cyclic flow. Matter cycles through an ecosystem. Energy shows one-way flow. It comes in and leaves as low-quality heat. Now, if we arrange our organisms in order, we see that we get sunlight is given energy to the producers. Producers provide energy to the primary consumers to the secondary consumers and to the tertiary consumers. So we can arrange our organisms as the energy passes through them. And what we produce is we produce a food chain. So this food chain is a connection of organisms based on how energy flows through the ecosystem. How energy is passed from one species to the next. Now each level in our food chain you can see is called a trophic level. In this diagram, we have four trophic levels. In most trophic level, in most food chains, there's a limited number of trophic levels. Most food chains only have about five trophic levels. That's because of the second law of thermodynamics. Every time you do an energy change, useful energy is lost. So, from when you go from sunlight to producer, energy is lost. From producer to consumer, you lose it. Primary consumer to secondary consumer, you lose it. Secondary to tertiary, you lose useful energy. So our food chain is showing the flow of energy through our ecosystem. Now, most food chains are going to start with a producer at the very bottom level. Um, Georgia has large amounts of salt marsh and our salt marsh is some of the most productive ecosystems on the entire planet. They have a higher productivity than most tropical rainforests. 
but nothing eats the producers. We have to wait for those grasses on our salt marshes to die and become detritus, dead organic matter. And that's where the food chain starts. It actually eats the dead plants rather than the live plants. So there are some odd food chains out there. But for most of the time, we'll do nice simple ones. And on the next slide, we'll see our nice simple beginning food chain. So here's our nice uh, beginning food chain. It starts out with um, plants growing around a pond. The plants are being eaten by our herbivore. Our herbivore, a, gra a grasshopper, is eaten by a spider. The spider is eaten by a frog, and our frog gets eaten by our bass. So we've got a five trophic level food chain. And again, remember that five levels is normally about the average, simply because of the energy lost at each step because of the second law of thermodynamics. So you should be able to draw out a food chain um, just like this and be able to label the sections, which ones are primary consumers, which ones are secondary consumers, what's in trophic level one, what would be found in trophic level four. Now, if we could go out and measure the amount of energy found at each level of a food chain. So here we've got one that goes from phytoplankton, the green slimy stuff in lake water, to zooplankton, the animals, microscopic animals that eat the uh, green slime, through to fish, through to humans that are eating the fish, um, we'd be able to find that there's a huge amount of energy found as producers and much less energy found as the consumers. And our diagram shows why. As we go from the bottom of our food chain to the top, at every single level, we are losing heat energy. So heat is lost. Second law of thermodynamics. Every time you do an energy change, useful energy is lost. So then we have large amounts of energy found at the base of every food chain, very little energy at the top of the food chain. So on average, we lose about 90% of the energy at each trophic level. So we lose about 90% of the energy, only keeping about 10% of the energy. So our values over here on the left hand side are going down about 90% each time. Only 10% is passed on. And it's nice and easy. Uh, with a nice 10% pass on, all you have to do is drop one zero from the end and you're losing 10% each time. So this is often represented as a pyramid of biomass. Um, uh, you can see the pyramid shape here and rather than trying to measure the amount of energy at each level in the food chain what we try and measure is the weight of living organism so here we've got grass to mice to snake to hawk and if we were to weigh the amount of grass that it takes to keep the mice alive we should find that there is way more grass than mice and then if we weigh the amount of mice if found in that area compared to the amount of snakes found in that area the mice are much heavier than the snakes. This is needed so that there are enough mice to feed the snakes not just one meal but continuously over their lifetimes. Obviously if we compared one snake to the weight of one mouse then the single snake is heavier but this is not comparing individuals this is comparing all of the mice found in that ecosystem to all of the snakes found in that ecosystem. So you've got to collect every single mouse that's out there and weigh all of them. Collect every single snake that's out there and weigh all of them. Compare that to all the plants. And it should be easy to see that if you look out your window, just look out the window, if you can see plants, you can see way more plants than you can animals. Um, just the number of plants that are out there vastly outweighs the number of animals. Uh, that's because they have to for our trophic levels to be able to lose about 90% every single time you go through the food chain. Now that loss in energy um, t 
teaches us a lot about how we can feed everybody on our planet. We have about 7 billion people on the planet right now. And those 7 billion people have to be fed. And we generate enough food to feed everybody. Notice that if we spend our time eating animal protein, trying to eat lots of cows, you can feed many less people than if you try and feed them plant protein. So if you take a food chain that goes from um, grains to cows to humans, remember there's a 90% loss in energy at each food, ch food trophic level. So what we're going to have is we're going to have 90% loss when we go from the cows to the people. If we just get rid of the cows, move the people down one trophic level, then we've gained 90% of the energy so we can feed 90% more people. Instead of just one kilogram of people, we can feed 10 kilograms of people. So if you wanted to try and provide food for a more developed country, a country that doesn't have enough food for its people, not just providing food aid, not giving them food, but making them farm to produce food for their own population. It should be doing arable farming, farming of crops, not farming of animals. Food chains lead to one other interesting concept. And that would be our, in, our concept of bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Because of the shape of the food chain, when you add chemicals to the base of the food chain, they get concentrated as they move towards the higher carnivores. We said that there's massive amounts of biomass in the producer's level, and very few uh, carnivores at the top of our food chain. So when we go from the base of our food chain up towards the top of the food chain, chemicals get concentrated. The most classic example of this is the pesticide DDT. DDT is a brilliant pesticide. It is incredibly good at killing insects and was used extensively to control mosquitoes. Uh, really, it removed um, malaria from from the planet. Um, the area of Georgia where we live used to have malaria mosquitoes and we have absolutely no malaria anymore because we whacked them all with DDT. The problem with uh, DDT is that it is a persistent pesticide. Persistent meaning that it stays poisonous for long, long periods of time. So when you sprayed it, um, it didn't just kill the mosquitoes. It also entered the water and was passed through the food chain. So it went from the minute little animals, the plankton in the water, into small fish, and from small fish into larger fish, and from larger fish into the top carnivores. So in this case, the top carnivores would be our brown pelicans. Now there, it would biomagnify. And that is the fact that there's very small amounts of it in the water, but large amounts of it because it is funneled through the food chain into our pelicans. So that magnification occurs because of this funneling action of the food chain. Bioaccumulation is that these pelicans don't eat just once. They eat numerous times a day, every day, every year that they're alive. So over their lifetime, they accumulate pesticide within their tissues. Every week they accumulate a bit more. Every month they accumulate a little bit more. So the magnification is the funneling action of the food chain. The accumulation is that that funneling action happens every day, week after week, year after year, so the chemicals accumulate in the top carnivores. Now, DDT um, was used dramatically all over the United States. So it was sprayed on beaches to remove sand nets, um, to try and get rid of mosquitoes and biting midges. 
So here we can see a southern beach that's spraying DDT on people as they're moving onto the beach. So here we have a small child coming on there. So large amounts of DDT uh, were used and it was accumulating in the top carnivores consistently over time. It was being magnified by the food chain consistently over time. That led to a buildup of DDT within our brown pelicans and almost made the pelican go extinct. Not only pelicans but also golden eagles and bald eagles were all put um, on the brink of extinction by this DDT. DDT prevents organisms from using calcium and as you know birds use calcium to make eggshells. So these birds could not make eggshells. Their eggshells got incredibly thin and therefore when they laid the eggs uh, they would fail to hatch, they would crack or break or they would break inside the female and decay and kill the female. So pelicans were just dying left, right and center. Uh, eagles and hawks are dying left, right and center. And in the end we end up banning DDT. And if you're spraying chemicals into the environment uh, that means your children are having to wear gas masks, uh, you probably should be thinking, is this the right thing to do? And we were fortunate that scientists looked at our top carnivores and picked out the fact that DDT was impacting the carnivores at an alarming rate because of biomagnification. And you've got to remember that humans are a top carnivore. We are at the top of most food chains here in the United States. So it wasn't only accumulating in the birds, it was accumulating uh, inside people as well. When I was in college in Wales, um, we actually had everyone in the class biopsied to see if we contained DDT. Now you need to remember that DDT was banned uh, when I was born. The year I was born, DDT was banned. So I actually never lived in an area that used DDT. And yet when I was in college, I had my fat, subcutaneous fat biopsied, and I have DDT within my system. Um, it had been bioaccumulated into me over time by eating organisms that were around when DDT was being used and was in their tissues. And one of the main problems is that DDT is persistent. It doesn't rot. So when an organism dies, it can give so let's look at some ways to avoid bioaccumulation and biomagnification of pesticides up food chains. One very simple way is just to stop um, applying pesticides uh, where they won't do what you want them to do. Um, this is a great picture of aerial spraying showing how large amounts of the pesticide are not actually being applied to the pest. Uh, it's drifting off in the wind and influence in other organisms. Now, if you want to kill um, an organism that is on the crop then you need to apply the pesticide to the organism you don't need to apply it to the trees next to your crop or to the homes across the road from your crop. So being more specific in your application would prevent quite as much biomagnification. Being specific definitely cost more money though and spending money is not something people want to do. Um, if you want to be able to just spray simply then there are new alternatives that are better pesticides. One of the classic pesticides now available are called photodegradable pesticides. Photo means light, degradable, breaking down, destruction, removing. So photodegradable pesticides are destroyed by sunlight. They're applied to fields, apple orchards, sprayed at night. Um, they kill pests on the apple trees. When the sun comes up, the sunlight breaks down that pesticide. So in the morning, it can't actually pass up the food chain because the pesticide's gone. Um, it also has a second benefit in the apple orchards need uh, bees to pollinate all of the flowers and if you use a photodegradable pesticide it will be gone when the bees come out and start to work again the next morning. Um, but there's no doubting that photodegradable pesticides cost more and 
you've got to decide whether you're willing to pay a little bit extra to protect organisms that you don't want to kill and to protect um, the ecosystem from biomagnification or whether you want to go with the cheapest one and maybe face dangers such as you losing bald eagles, losing golden eagles, losing um, maybe a couple of years of your kid's life. What we're talking about here is how risk averse are you? How risk averse? How averse or against risk? So obviously you could use a cheaper, more bioaccumulating pesticide and risk not living quite as long or not having your children risk as long. Or you could say, oh my gosh, no, we can't do that at all. I want to use absolutely no pesticides. Um, and therefore have less food available, the food would be more expensive, but not have any biomagnification or bioaccumulation. So each person is going to have a different level of their risk averseness, how risk averse they are. Some people are going to want to spend more to have no chemicals on their food. Some people are want to spend less and will just put up with the risk that maybe those chemicals will bioaccumulate within their tissues. Here's one neat little example that's a non-chemical method for getting rid of pests, the salad vac. So just huge, huge vacuums it moves forward, the fans turn on, and they literally just suck off insects and suck off caterpillars um, from the lettuce plants. They're fed through the spinning blades of the fan, so they get chopped into little pieces, are blown out, and just land on, um, on back on the field. So this is a, a method that was originally set up as a trial. The modern versions don't clip to a tractor, they're their own version and they're controlled um, using GPS technology. And they just drive up and down the fields all on their own um, using the vacuum to suck off all of those pests, chop them up and spit them back out as dead organic matter which will just become fertilizer. So again, this is a bit more expensive um, but it doesn't produce any chemicals that can bioaccumulate or biomagnify up the food chain. And here we have uh, a food web. Now we've talked quite a bit about food chains and when we have food chains we know that it's showing the energy flow from one organism to the next. So if you look in the very center of the slide you can see where we go from phytoplankton through zooplankton, through fish, through penguins, emperor seals, killer whales. So what we have is this flow of energy from one organism to the next. But in the real world, um, it, there's not just one line that energy can take. It doesn't have to go phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish. It could go phytoplankton, zooplankton, squid. So straight away we have two separate food chains. Phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish, phytoplankton, zooplankton, squid. Now, if we connect multiple food chains together, what we get is a food web, a group of interconnecting food chains. Food webs are incredibly complex. At the beginning of the course, we did the fact that if you tug on any living thing, you'll find it connected to everything else. And that is definitely linked with our food webs. If you pull on any part of the food web, it connects to all other organisms. Um, these are incredibly complex. We know and understand very few food webs. The example the book uses is this Antarctic web because they're easy. Antarctica is, remember, one of the low diversity areas. It has lots and lots of limiting factors, limiting amounts of sunlight, limiting temperature, few species. So the book uses this food web because it's one of the easiest ones and yet it's not complete. It just says squid. It doesn't say what type of squid. It says fish. It doesn't list what type of fish. And it doesn't link out all of the different types of plankton. They're just lumped as zooplanktons and phytoplanktons. It is so complex generating these 
that it's almost beyond a single person's ability to comprehend all of the interconnections. So what can be the take home message? Take home message is, in environmental science, you can never do one thing. And, and that's often called the first law of environmental science. You can never do just one thing. Um, if you were to go and collect squid, which is now happening, people are fishing for squid, well, because the numbers of squid would then go down, notice that you can't do that without impacting the number of emperor penguins, because they used to eat squid. And that would impact the number of leopard seals, and that would impact the number of killer whales. So by eating squid, you're actually altering other things. You're altering the number of whales, not just squid. So our webs show our interconnection, and they show how you can never do just one thing in an ecosystem. This is the food web um, that I stole from your book. Uh, it's not quite put together in the same way as the food web that we saw on Antarctica, um, but it's still an interconnecting group of food chains. And what you should be able to do is pull out just a few um, food chains from this food web. So if I gave you a food web and said, okay, give me two food chains from this food web, you should be able to do that. So remember that energy is just a one-way flow through the ecosystem. It comes in as sunlight, is captured through photosynthesis, is stored as potential energy, as food, and then is lost as heat. And remember that matter is cyclic through the ecosystem. So if we look at the matter cycles, we find that we see uh, biogeochemical cycles of nutrients. We do not need to know all of these. Uh, again, these tend to be very complex. But I do want to quickly talk about the carbon cycle. So in every one of these nutrient cycles, there has to be a store of the chemicals somewhere in the environment. And the store of carbon within the environment is always carbon dioxide in the air. Carbon dioxide in the air is our store. And what happens is that carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants and used to make sugar using the process of photosynthesis. And then respiration will break down those sugars and release that carbon dioxide again as carbon dioxide in the environment. We breathe out carbon dioxide. But we don't breathe out all of the carbon dioxide we take in. Some of the carbon that comes in as sugars and food that we eat, we used to build our bodies. So some of that carbon gets deposited in our bodies as our muscles, as our bones, as our skin. And therefore it's trapped out of the atmosphere. Now as we decay, once we die, that carbon would be released again. But what happens if we don't decay? What happens if we're trapped in a bog, in a swamp, and we're just held there. Then we will produce a, a store of carbon within that bog or swamp. And over time that could become oil or become natural gas or become coal and therefore we'd have a store of carbon within those fossil fuels. Now when you dig up those fossil fuels and burn them you get the carbon out again. So what we have to remember on the planet is that for many years some carbon has been stored away as fossil fuels. So our basic carbon cycle looks like this, with carbon in the atmosphere being absorbed by our plants, passed through the food chain to herbivores and carnivores, and then being released into the atmosphere again. Just occasionally some of it is trapped in the bodies of organisms, and instead of being released by a decay cycle, it's actually sealed into the ground as fossil fuels. Now humans have impacted this cycle by coming along and digging up the fossil fuels and burning them and obviously that's then releasing large amounts of CO2 and they also come in and cut down forests, pave over grassland, produce homes and factories and so we've decreased the number of plants. 
Now as we decrease the number of plants, we stop our ability to suck CO2 out of the air. And as we burn the fossil fuels, we've increased the amount of CO2 put into the air. So the amount of CO2 in the air is increased. So we see that we see an increase in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere caused by most of the um, deforestation, fossil fuel burning, loss of plants, increased use of energy that humans are doing on the planet. So we do have some impact on the carbon cycle. We have an impact on our other nutrient cycles as well, but I will let you read about those in your textbook.